الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله الذي ليس لأوليته ابتداء ولا لأزليته انقضاء وانحصنت الأوصاف عن كنه معرفته وردعت أظمته الأقول والذي لا تباري عنه سماء سماء ولا أرض أرضا ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على سيد البطحاء سيد المرسلين والأنبياء أبي القاسم محمد المصطفى اللهم صل على محمد قال محمد وأجل وعلى الجوهرة القدسية البتول العذراء سيدة النساء فاطمة الزهراء وعلى بعلها أمير المؤمنين وبنيها الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد لا سيما على بقية الله وحجته الكبرى الذي بيمنه رزق الورى وبوجوده ثبتت الأرض والسماء ولولاه لساخت الأرض بأهلها واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من حين عداوتهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال أمير المؤمنين عليه الصلاة والسلام أكرم نفسك من كل دنية وإن ساقتك إلى الرغائب صلوات اللهم صل على محمد قال محمد فأجل فرجا Maintaining a strong spirit in the time of difficulty. This is the trait of a mu'min. And we need to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely going to test us. Seeking the dua from Allah by saying, Oh my Lord, don't put me through any bala. It does not make any sense. Because Allah is never going to go against His own Quran, His own word. He has already promised. So He is bound to test us. What we are supposed to seek the dua from Allah is what we learned from the dua of Imam al-Qadim where he says La taj'al musibatana fi deenina Don't make the musibat in the matters of my religion regarding our religion Bala is bound to arrive we are going to face the difficulties and calamities and tests and turmoils. But those should be directed towards my dunya, life of this world, not my deen. That's the, the way a woman operates. So when one person comes to Imam al-Baqir and said, Al-Yubtal al-Mu'min is a Mu'min tested? Imam al-Baqir replied back, is a non-Mu'min tested? So we learn that tests are always for a Mu'min. For a non-Mu'min, the Bala is a Rab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Clearly specified in several narrations and Allah will mu'mina imtihan walil kafir al-rab will ambiya'i daraja Bala is 
امتحان التست فور المؤمن اند بانشمنت فور الكافر اند فور ذا بروفيتس اوف الله وين ذا بلا كمز اتس ا مينز اوف اليفيشن اوف ذير ليفلز كرامة النفس holding our dignity aloof higher than the world of matter staying attached Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maintaining the spiritual connection with God strong this is what karamat nafs is all about and if you look at the du'as from Ahlul Bayt. Let me mention this. This is a dua from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Ahlul Balagha where he says to Allah, Allahumma aj'al nafsi awwala kalimatin tamtazi'uha min karaimi wa awwala wadi'atin tamtazi'uha min wada'i min ni'amika Oh my Lord, make my soul the first honorable thing that you take away from me and the first of the amanats that you retrieve back among the blessings that you have given me what Imam Ali is trying to say that means at the time of uh, when a person gets close to death you find, you find some people um, get paralyzed Their hands are no longer working, their eyes can't see, their ears can't hear, they can't speak. So several of the blessings have been taken away ahead of their soul taken out of the body. So Imam Ali says, Oh my Lord, take the soul of mine, the first thing that you take away from me. That means I don't end up becoming dependent on my children, on others. He wants to maintain his dependence on Allah only. That's the karamat of nafs. Allah ma'atabatabai rahmatullah said that the word karama, this value of al karama in Arabic, has no translation in Farsi. We just say karamat, which is Arabic, right? When Allah Taala can say that, or I can say that the word al karama, this value of al karama, has no translation in any language of the world. And our Urufa say that it's not just about al karama; it's about all the values of Quran. Can you find a translation for haya? No. Well, that's the commodity which is not found in so many of the societies, right? Why would they make a word for it when the commodity is unfound? Effat, no translation. Shahamat, no translation. Shuja'at, no Islamic definition of shuja'at. Don't take it as bravery. That's not the Islamic definition. We have Islamic definition of those divine values. And so on and so forth. So, karama is something which we need to value. We need to value all these divine values. And this is one of the reasons why Imam Khomeini did one of after the Islamic Revolution. He entered Arabic as a second language in the schools. Right? Because that's the language of Quran. That's the official language of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the language of Hadith. And my teacher, Ayatollah Jawadi, Allah, was saying in his tafsir, when a person dies, every single person ends up speaking Arabic. So Arabic is the future. But there's no praise, because every Tom, Dick and Harry would also be speaking Arabic in the grave, right? The praise is where you voluntarily learn and familiarize your soul with the values of Qur'an in your lifetime. And those values are found in that language and in order for you to properly digest, you know, it's very important you, that you learn that language as well. That's the big deal. So it's about the values. 
And this is one of the reasons, I don't want to go to that tangent, but this is one of those reasons why the enemies of Islam tried their best to take Arabic out of Farsi, right? The father of Shah, the de-Islamization agenda given to Ataturk and him, right? At the same time by the West. De-Islamization, how? By taking the words of Arabic out. And I always say this sentence in my speeches, I wish, I wish our Shia community understood the Islam of Ahlul Bayt as much as the Zionist lobby, the global Zionist lobby is understanding Islam of Ahlul Bayt and taking it as the only challenge for their survival. That's why it has robbed them of their comfortable sleeps in Brussels and Washington DC and Tel Aviv. I wish our Shia community understood the, the values of Islam of Ahl al-Bayt as much as the global Zionist lobby is understanding it. And that's why they are engaged in doing what they are doing against Islam to root out Islam. If we understood that much, we would succeed in both the worlds. But a lot of people in our own community don't understand our own Islam even that much. That's pathetic. Okay, so now this is one dua where we learn karamat al nafs, holding ourselves strong in the time of difficulty. Now you go to the dua of Imam al Sajjad alayhi salam. Allahumma sunni wajhi bil yasar wa la taktazil jahi bil iqtar fa astarziqu talibi rizqika wa astartifu shirar khalqika wa abtali bi aw wa abtala bi hamdin man a'tani wa aftadna bi zammi man mana'ani wa anta min wara'i dhalika kulli and this great dua, although every dua is equally great, we learn from this dua that Imam is asking Allah that, Oh my Lord, give my risk and sustenance through yourself to me. Don't give my risk through someone else. So I end up thanking him, praising him instead of praising you. Look at the karamat of nafs, highness of the spirituality that we learn from these words. This is what a woman is supposed to be. So, some people, you know, they go to, they shave the beard just because they want to secure the job. They, they perceive it like this. In their perception, shaving the beard is going to save. You think it is going to save your job? So you think your employer is the razik and sustainer? And deep down in your heart, what's going on at the rear end of your brainstorming? Are you thinking that he's the one who provides the risk for you? Or you take off the hijab when you go to the workplace? So you think your employer provides the job to you? Is that what you think? Prophet has said in his wasiyat to Abu Zar, beautiful advices. The divine pen has already moved, past tense, has already moved about what is going to happen till the day of judgment. And our Urufa say, on top of that, Qajjafat Qalam. The divine pen, the ink of the divine pen has dried up. That's what the Orofan add. What they're trying to say is that nothing else will, will be added by Allah. That's what they're trying to say. So when the risk sustenance is in the hands of Allah and it has already moved and written what is bound to reach me and you, then is it even logical to, to think otherwise that you can, by pleasing somebody, you can make more money? 
or displeasing somebody is going to deprive you of the money. That's what some people think. Yeah? Every problem that we face in our practical life has something to do with one or more of the problems that a person is facing in his belief system. That's why I always say in my speeches, we need to teach the beliefs. Religion is not an inherited commodity. Don't inherit your religion. Religion is always proven with evidences. One of the reasons why you find some of our youths when they go to colleges and universities, they tend to assimilate. There is no room for assimilation in Islam. We integrate based on mutual respect. Here we are unlike others and we are proud to be unlike others because we have the Puritan value system. Islam is a package of values. The day you compromise over your value system, you are spiritually dead. No one would bother to respect you. You don't deserve to be respected because you didn't respect your own self and your value system. Coming back to the uh, point that I was say, saying that uh, a Kareem person who has karamatul nafs, he honors himself and holds himself honorable, is always detached from the world of pattern. That's how you hold yourself honorable and maintain your karamatul nafs and that's how you can overcome the challenges that you face in the world of matter. In order to confront the challenges successfully in the world of matter, you have to hold, elevate yourself above the attachments. So you are living in the world of matter with zero attachment with any of the material things. And every attachment is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we overcome in a nutshell. So now, um, um, in one of the battles we find there was a gap taking place between the Holy Prophet sallallahu and Islamic Muslim army. A gap happened due to a reason and one of the mushriks found a chance. So he made himself reach the Prophet and found the Prophet alone. Prophet was relaxing under the tree. And he took his sword, put it next to the head, neck of the Prophet and said, Man yunjika min nil'an Who is going to save you now? The Mushrik said to the Prophet, and look at this spontaneous response. This is called Karamatun Nafs of the Prophet. May our souls be sacrificed on him and his highness. He said, Rabbi Warabuka, my Lord and your Lord. That means between the edge of your sword and the skin of my head, there is a power. Who can save me? How many people have that sort of courage and karamat? No one, other than the Prophet and Alibad. Nobody. So much, and then after a while, and then after that, he ends up dropping the sword from his hand. And Prophet stands up, Prophet goes there and pick up, picks up the sword and then Prophet stretches the sword towards him and said, Who is going, Man Yunjika, who is going to save you? And he said, Your Karamat, because you are a Kareem person. And Prophet let him go. This is about the karamat al nafs. This is about the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is going to happen when you are detached from the world of matter. And Prophet is the one who remembers Allah first and foremost and always. The first thing that he remembers Allah is Allah and all that he remembers is Allah. Nothing but Allah. Even in the story of Prophet Musa السلام, who is one of the five greatest messengers, when the children of Israel saw 
Pharaoh with his forces, Pharaoh with his forces following them, and now they are too close, right? And this side of the of the water is the army, uh, the people of uh, Prophet Musa, children of Israel. On the other corner, uh, behind them, is, are their people. Now they are coming inside the water, the same way that Allah has made. So, children of Israel got so scared, scared to death. Now, how can we save from Fir'aun? So, it says that Prophet Musa has said, La tahzan. Prophet Musa said, Inna ma'iya rabbi. Certainly, along with me is my Lord. That's what Prophet Musa said, because he had trust in Allah. Whereas when our Prophet was in the cave, and Mushrikeen of Mecca at the time of migration followed him, chased him, and they reached at the door of the cave, and the companion with him started to cry. What did the Prophet say at that time? La tahzan in Allah ma'ala. Don't be sorrowful. Certainly Allah is with us. So when our orofas, the perspective of an arif is always different from an alim. An alim has bookish information. We are not supposed to learn our religion from alims. I wish the Islamic Ummah were following the orofa only. Everything would have been corrected in Islamic Ummah. Because an Arif tells you after seeing the realities. He has seen that. He's been there and seen that above the bookish information. Which even the non-Muslims can read books. And they are reading books. Maybe some of them are reading more than some of us, generally speaking. So, the perspective of an Arif is always different. Eh? The Orofa say, when Prophet Musa was in the turmoil, facing the hardship, you know, Prophet Musa said, In the Ma'iya Rabbi, certainly with me is my Lord. That means he's bringing himself first, Ma'iya, himself first. And then he mentions Allah. In the Ma'iya Rabbi. Whereas when our Prophet was in the in similar hardship, right? Prophet said, In Allah Ma'ana. Certainly Allah is with us. So Allah first, with us second, us second. Putting Allah first. It's a big deal. It's a very big deal. Our Orofa say when a person's son dies, daughter dies, you know. So what is your first reaction at the time? Later on you find people, your relatives, your friends come over to for you know, condolences. Later on, everyone shows sabr, right? It's not a big deal. What a big deal is that, what's your reaction number one? That shows you a level of shanakht and ma'rifat and in-depth recognition of Allah. Whether you have the ma'rifat of Allah or not, look at the reaction number one of the person when the bala arrives. That shows his marifat. How much marifat? I can make so many claims. It doesn't take me nowhere. There are signs. Please say salawat. Allahumma salallahu Muhammad Muhammad Sajjad. If you look at Munajat Shabaniya, Munajat and Shabaniya is one of the greatest assets and treasures that we have. Alhamdulillah. Imam Khomeini was Ustad al Orafat. So many of, student, of his students are the biggest Arifs of today. He is a teacher of 350 plus Mushtaqids. You don't find a person like him that easy, right? In the history of, of uh, non Maksum people. So when he was asked, which is the best dua that you like? All the du'as of Prophet and Ahl Bayt are great. But which of the du'as that you like? And he's the right person to be addressed this question. He said, 
is inside the in, in, in the Masjid al-Haram and next to the Kaaba Abdul Malik ibn Marwan is there Tawud ruler of that time one of the Shias comes to Imam Sajjad al-Islam and says that Ya Ibn Rasulullah here is the ruler why don't you just uh, you know it's a good opportunity go and ask him to return back Fadak to you the garden of Fadak belongs to your mother right the Fatima al-Islam here is the ruler he's here Right now, let's take benefit from the opportunity. Ask him. <laughs> Look at the response. We are talking about karamat and nafs. What saves us in the hardships in the life? Karamat and nafs saves us. Zero attachment with the world of matter saves us. Imam Sajjad Islam replied back to him, Wayhaka. Afi haram illahi as'allullah ghayr Allah. He says that shall I in the haram and holy sanctuary of Allah ask Allah something other than Allah? When you are in the haram of Allah, you, you, you want me to in, in the haram of Allah to ask from Allah something other than Allah Himself? Look at the perspective of Imam Sajjad um, How high they are trying to take us. Now look at the dua of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And in the, he says in, the, in his statement in the hadith, it's not dua. Inna Allaha yakrahum yuhibbu ma'ali al umur wa yakrahu sifsafaha. Allah loves the high thinkings. High goals, high affairs, 
and dislikes the lowly thinkings and lowly affairs and lowly goals. Set your goals high. They have already reached the highest stage and now they're calling us up. Because Quran says, talking about Allah commanding his messenger, Qul ta'alaw atlu ma harrama rabbukum. Say, come up. I recite upon you what your Lord has made haram. And my teacher had said in tafsir, the word ta'alaw in Arabic is only used in a place where the audience is lower than the status of the speaker. The speaker is standing somewhere high, audience is somewhere low, and this is where the word is used in Arabic. If the audience and the speaker are on the same level, in Arabic we don't use the ah now, we say ilayya. Come to me. Prophet didn't say ta'ala, didn't say ilayya, he says ta'ala. Quran says ta'ala. That means Prophet is standing way higher than everyone else in his audience. All the prophets of God are under his command. 123,999 under his command. Didn't he say, Adam and everyone other than him, after him, are under my banner. What a banner. What a great prophet. We need to be proud. So he's already in the highest position. He already said, Ana wa Ali wa Fatima wa Hassan wa Hussein fi hadirat al-Quds. في قبة بيضاء سقفها عرش الرحمن الزوجل. Me and Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein are in حضيرة القدس which is the highest level of paradise في قبة بيضاء in the white dome سقفها عرش الرحمن الزوجل. Its ceiling is the throne of Allah. So they are already in the highest possible place and now they deserve to address people like us the now come up. How much we can detach ourselves from the world of matter. And all these attachments is the one that's causing people to sell out their faith, right? Compromising on their values. Supporting the Tawuts, supporting the Vladimir and criminals because of the attachment with the world of matter. Now, now they want to justify their wrongs. And some people end up Changing the principles, they try, at least they try themselves to change the principles of Sharia to fit their lifestyle. All that is going on because of the attachment with the world of matter. These people have zero karamatul nafs. Please say salawat. Allahumma salatu Muhammad. In Dua Kumar, Imam Ali is teaching us وَجْعَلْنِي مِنْ أَحْسَنِ عَبِيدِكَ نَصِيبًا لِلْدَّكَ Look at the words. Please pay attention to these words. وَجْعَلْنِي مِنْ أَحْسَنِ عَبِيدِكَ نَصِيبًا لِلْدَّكَ Make me among the best of your slaves in terms of the share next to you. That means I get the biggest chunk from you. Best level. Well, closest in terms of the level and the close and the special most special person in terms of closeness towards you make you the most special person in terms of closeness our Ahlul Bayt are not asking us to set our goals low. Oh my Lord, just protect me from the hellfire. This is not a high goal. This is a very low goal, our Bolo say. Allah is not going to send, um, you know, Mustafa Afin, the weakened masses into the hellfire. He's not going to send the Haywanat, children, babies, into the hell. He's Al Hakim, he's Al Alim, he's Rahman, he's Rahim, right? Let's not bring our goals down. Elevate our way of thinking. When Imam al Hussein al Islam was, it was said to him, Yemen is problematic for you. Iraq is problematic. Okay, Hijaz is problematic. Go somewhere else in the desert to protect your life. 
what did Imam Hussain say at that time? This is karamatun nafs. Law lam yabqa li manjabun wala mahwa ma bayahtu jizikan tamu awiyah. Even if there is no place of refuge remaining for me, I will still not do the bayat oath of allegiance towards Yazid, son of Muawiyah. This is Imam Hussain Salaam. This is what we feel proud of for having an Imam like him. Not that we, we are, didn't, had, didn't have any options, so we end up supporting the Imam. No, that's not a big deal because you were cornered. Even if you were cornered, you were cornered or not cornered, you still stand for your same divine values. That's a big deal. You know, it's, some people are biased because they don't end up, they, they don't have what it takes to do haram. They don't have those means and tools and money and wealth and stuff. If they find it, probably they would be the first person to jump towards the haram, right? Because in, deep down in their, in their mind, those harams are cooking. They are thinking, planning about that. You do what you plan. That's why what Orofa say and scholars of Allah say, don't even think about haram in your minds. That, will, that can possibly lead you towards doing haram as well. Cleans, clean your mind from even thinking about haram. So, mm, detaching of ourselves from the world of matter. Imam Ali has said in his statement, Ala hurrun yada'u hazahi lumaba li ahliha. That's the one in Ruaya. Is there a free man who can leave this lumaba for the one who deserves it? Lumaba in Arabic means the particles of the food that get stuck in your gums, between your gums, after you have chewed the food. So Imam Ali is calling this dunya as the chewed particles of the food chewed by the previous generations. So many of them ran after this dunya and its attachments. Ah, no, they chewed the food and that those particles of the chewed food are still remaining. Is there a free man who would not go for those chewed particles of the remainder food of the previous generations? That's the real freedom, freeing ourselves from the matter, right? And uh, what a beautiful statement. If you pay attention to the meaning, you would enjoy. Oh my Lord, grant me the perf perfect breaking away towards you. That means I break away from Masib Allah, everything other than Allah, towards Allah. Look at what they are teaching us. Kamal and Tata'i, like. And my teacher, Ayatollah Jawadi, Hafizullah said that the student of Ahmed Bayt, Imam Khomeini, also said the statements on the footsteps of Imam Al Hussein. That if you send me from one airport to the other airport, I have no other place to go, I will still continue. Let's continue my Islamic movement. This is called inqidam in Allah. So you have no attachment with this world. You don't even think about this world. You think about uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, uh, when you find people having a um, uh, this is all about the ma'rifat, the level of ma'rifat that a person has. So let me quote the exact statement of my teacher. He says that Rahavurdi Har Safari Te Andazaye Zadira Ehanas. Anke Rahtushesh Andishes Rahavurdi Shah Mushakhasas. Anke 
زاد راهش شهود است محصول او هم مشخص است کسانی که those people who are seeing the realities and then going for it like I said earlier in my speech it's not a bookish information they have been there and seen that and now they are describing us to us Ayatullah Uthma Jawad Maliki Tabrizi Rahmatullah is a great Arif of ours delivering his Dars al-Kharij and subject of fiqh and all of a sudden he started to talk about Irfan in the middle and one of the students objected teacher we came here to learn ilm al-fiqh from you and you started to talk about Irfan and he said all the problems of Islamic Ummah are because of the fact that our fiqh Islamic jurisprudence got separated from Irfan such a great statement and that's the fact, fact of the matter and that's the solution as well if you find, want to find a solution then you have to uh, again uh, bring Irfan and fiqh together that's the solution for the current problems that the Islamic world is facing this is the solution bring ma'rifat in the middle and everything will be resolved. So, um, because of the lack of ma'rifat, uh, because of the attachment of this world of matter, all the rest of the things are, are done and justified by some people, right? So, when um, there were people who considered um, you know, Iran first and Islam second. But Imam Ridwanullah was the one person who considered Islam first. And I won't say Islam anything else second, Islam second. Because these Orofa are those people who care about Allah only. Didn't he say, Wallahu ta'kurun as gayr al-khuda na tansidiyam? And these are people who are not afraid of anyone other than Allah. And that's why he, he can bring about an Islamic revolution. You find people from 86 countries, minimum 86 countries, studying in the Hausa of Qom. This is the Nuraniyat of Imam to spread the word of the Shayyu in far and wide corners of the world. There were people um, in this world um, who unfortunately were um, careless about the occupation of Masjid al-Aqsa. There were people in the Islamic world who used to see istikhara. When Imam Khomeini was captured by Shah, they were seeing istikhara. Shall we protest on the Dhul? That's why we say, you know, it's about your understanding of Islam. Some people have Zaykh Kaji tilted understanding of Islam and he was proud of his understanding of Islam he used to call it Islam and Naab and Muhammadi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the pure Muhammad and Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we received from the hand of Imam Ali Alayhi Salaam 11 of our Imams gave blood Islam which has been protected by the, and guaranteed by the blood of 11 Masum Imams not to mention the rest of the hundreds of thousands of Shubhada in the history so some people were seeing istikhara shall we protest over the Zul? well um, do you do istikhara for Salat al-Fajr? shall I pray uh, the Fajr prayers tomorrow? 
Does it make any sense to see Sakar about Salat? Allah has already told us it's wajib, right? We never see Sakar for wajib things. Do you do Sakar for haram things? Shall I do ghibat? Is there room to ask the question from Allah? Didn't Allah tell it in Quran through hadith of his, his representatives? Doesn't make any sense to ask again. Do we do istighar for mustahab things? Shall I pray salat al or not? <laughs> it's already told what's the ruling, right? There's no need to ask again. We don't do istighar for makruh thing. We only do it for the mubahat. So you can't understand from Islam and Quran and from the Holy Prophet, from Nahjul Balagha, up till now you could not understand what the stance and mawqif of a mu'min is supposed to be towards the zulm. That you're doing istikhara. Shall we protest when a mu'min was captured? Some people were doing istikhara. Some people uh, um, considered silence towards occupation of Masjid al-Aqsa as the right policy. Sukut. That was their understanding of Islam. Some people had irtibat and connection with the Dawoods. They had links. They don't want to harm their relations with the Ghalini. Look at the various various categories inside the Islamic Ummah. So, my teacher was saying that we can stand on the grave of Imam Khomeini and say, "Ashhadu anna ka qad aqamta salata wa aatayta zakata wa amarta bil ma'roof wa nahayta 'anil munkar wa jahadta fi Allah haqqa jihadihi hatta ataka al-iqi." You can say it. Because honestly, he did that sort of service which was never done by anybody. And he's the one who is liable for Iqamat al Salat, right? And all those Islamic rulings being practiced and installed. So this is this is only going to happen when a person has Kamal al Now, last point probably before I come to the end of my speech. There were some people, and there may be even today, some people in the Islamic Ummah who um, bring this as their evidence. The statement of Hadar Abdul Muttalib where he said about his camels being taken away by the army of Abraham. Ana Rabbul Ibil Fa inna lil bayte Rabban. So I am the Rabb, the caretaker of the camels, and certainly the house. And it and leave it to Allah. Whatever is going on in the Islamic world, just leave it upon Allah. It's a job of Imam Mahdi Islam. Let's not poke our nose into his affairs. Let him handle his job. I remember in one of his lessons he was saying that he gives beautiful examples. He is expert of giving nice examples for the youth, for the people. He's a very pious and wise scholar. So he was giving this example that uh, when the night comes, do you turn on the light? Why do you turn on the light? Just keep it dark. Because tomorrow the sun will rise, right? But you turn on the light. So how can you say that it's the job of Imam Ali Salam is going to take care of it? When you are in the darkness, you have to work hard for the light. You have to do your part. Unless if you want the Imam Ali Salam to come and fight against you as well. Is that what you want? So you want to become an obstacle, like, just like some others are becoming obstacle? So, 
My teacher says that there are some people who use this argument, the statement of Allah Abdul Muttalib as their argument to stay irrelevant of, towards the affairs of Islamic Ummah. And, and then he says that this argument is no longer valid because Hazrat Muttalib said that statement before the Nuzul and descending of Quran. And then, when Quran has already said, in awliyahu illa al-muttaqun, Surah Al-Anfal, verse 54, there is no room remaining for any individual in Islamic Ummah to use that argument at all after the revelation of this verse. Because Quran has fixed the mutawalli, who can be the mutawalli of the Kaaba? It has been fixed by Quran. And Allah has already fixed who is the mutawalli of the Islamic Ummah, the pious conditions fulfilling mujtahid. لَوْلَا حُضُورُ الْحَادِرُ وَقِيَامَ الْحُجَّةِ بِوُجُودِ النَّاسِرِ وَمَا أَخَذَ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْعُلْمَاءِ أَنْ لَا يُقَارُّ عَلَى قِذَّةِ ذَالِكْ بَلَا سَغَبِ مَظْلُومِ لَأَلْقَيْتُ حَبْلَهَا عَلَى ذَالِ بِهَا Did anyone really say that in the sermon number, in the sermon of Sheikh Shaqiyya, Khutbah Sheikh Shaqiyya in Ahtul Badala? So Allah didn't allow the scholars to stay silent if that, if that covenant was not taken from the scholars by Allah. I would also have let the, the reins of the Khilafat and covenants be on the back of the animal of Khilafat and let the animal go freely. Putting the reins on the back of the horse, what does it mean? You allowing the horse to roam around wherever he may wish to go. I would have done that too. Had it not been the, for the covenant that Allah has taken from the scholars. So we cannot stay silent, we cannot be idle, we cannot be indifferent, we cannot ignore. We have to stand and do our responsibility regardless of the result. And this is what he used to say that you talk to some people, they don't know, we don't have fighters, we don't have interceptors, we don't have tanks. Oh, so you think all the prophets of God had tanks? You fail to understand the qiyam and uprising of all the prophets of Allah in the Holy Quran, if you say that. Because Quran says, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَعِذُكُمْ بِوَاحِدَةٍ أَنْ تَكُمُ لِلَّهِ مَثْنَى وَفُرَادًا Say, all I advise you is to stand for the sake of Allah, مَثْنَى in pairs, وَفُرَادًا and alone. And Imam Ibn Lala used to say, all the scholars, all the prophets of God did their uprising alone. Later on, a few, few people joined. So we are supposed to do our duty, not to care about the result. And there are some people who are bringing attention towards, you know, the, you know, you talk about the affairs of Islamic Ummah, and uh, they bring about Ali Saud. Ali Saud are doing well. Ali Saud are the most crooked people, some of the most crooked people on the face of earth, no doubt. But they are not the root of the matter. The root of the matter is the Zionism and imperialism. Okay. This is what Imam Radwan Lale and Samah al Wali al Faqih of Allah, they have been asking the people to, to um, focus on the root cause of the problems, which is Zionism. And that's what I said to some of the brothers, uh, you know, who were talking about the Baqi movement and I said to them don't divert the attention from the root of the matter towards the branches Ali Saud are like the branches of the fitna even if you launch a campaign and you remove Ali Saud nothing absolutely Nothing could be resolved for Islamic Ummah because they are going to bring another subservient family to replace them. So Mubarak goes and Sisi comes. Right. 
nothing will be resolved. You need to focus on what the leader has said. وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا وَنَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Ya Allah, 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 Ya Allah Allahumma ansur al-Islam wa al-Muslimin Wa akhzur al-Kuffar wa al-Munafiqin Allahumma ansur man nasar al-Din Wa akhzur man khadal al-Muslimin Allahumma ansur wa ahfaz wa ayyid wa lama'ana al-Rabbaniyin Wa maraja'ana al-Rabbaniyin La sayyima al-Wali al-Faqi qa'id al-Muslimin اللهم انصر جيوش المسلمين وعساكر الموحدين اللهم فك عن الأسراء المسلمين اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضى وعدل في فرج مولانا صاحب الزمان واجعلنا من أنصاره وأشياعه وأتباعه وأعوانه بجاه محمد وآله الطاهرين Thank you